Van Koren, who is from, from Arbo Academy um, University. And he, mainly his research is on mathematical learning difficulties and the cognitive factors that predict those abilities or affect those abilities. Uh, but currently he's very interested in maths anxiety, uh, which he's gonna to talk to us about today, um, about maths anxiety, whether it does or does not affect task performance. I'm sorry, my dog's decided to bark in the background at that moment. So I'm gonna hand over to you now, Johan, and I look forward to hearing your talk. Thank you very much, Rebecca. I will start by sharing my screen and put it in presenter mode. Okay, so uh, hello everyone. My name is Johan and uh, I'm going to aim to talk about uh, math anxiety for about 45 minutes so that we have some time for questions and, and discussions afterwards. Uh, and uh, the overall outline of my talk is uh, more or less that we will talk a little about uh, development of math anxiety. Uh, how, how does the development look like, for example, with younger kids and then with a bit of older ones. And, and then also this uh, interesting thing that we have quite established uh, relationship between math anxiety and performance, at least if we look at it cross-sectionally. So what, what added value could longitudinal studies uh, show us on, on that relation? So, so I will bit discuss this. Uh, longitudinal relations between anxiety and performance. Uh, and then in the end, also talk a little bit about what kind of, or are math anxiety interventions, are they effective in, in reducing math anxiety and improving math performance? So uh, uh, let's, let's start then. Uh, if we just uh, first think about how we could define math anxiety. So, so one way to put it is, is it that it's like defined as feelings of tension and anxiety that interferes with the manipulation of numbers and the solving of mathematical problems in both ordinary life and, and academic situations like school, for example. And, uh, and again, if we think about uh, what, what can cause math anxiety in, in students and, and in adults and in younger children? So uh, there isn't like any one, one predictor of math anxiety, but this is, as with most other phenomena, quite, quite complex in that, that many, many different factors can contribute to, to math anxiety. And uh, I actually wanted to, to show now the a new study that was actually, it was published, I think. It came out on this Monday, I think. So, so it's, it's quite new. And, and there the Lau and colleagues had looked at, at math anxiety and, and performance link in, in over 1 million students. Uh, so they had looked at this international comparative, uh, international studies that, that looked at math performance and, and they also have measured math anxiety. And they looked, for, for example, on what kind of factors are, are related to math anxiety. And, and is it so that math anxiety and performance, how are they, are they related uh, across countries and across cultures uh, and so on? And, and they actually found, or in a way that they, they just confirmed what, what we more or less already know, that there is quite a consistent negative correlation between math anxiety and math performance. And it's, it's rather stable across countries and across cultures. So this, this uh, relationship is, is found basically everywhere in the world. And uh, other things that they, they found in this uh, rather like uh, large, large sample is that uh, uh, teacher competence was a factor. Uh, that was relative, uh, negatively related to, to math anxiety. So that means that if, if the teacher felt competent in teaching math, that had a, like reduced the math anxiety of, of students. Uh, then they also found that, uh, that 
that parental homework involvement was again positively related to math anxiety. So, so that, that that's means that if, if the parents were more involved with the homework of the student, then also the student experienced more, more math anxiety. Uh, and this is also not a new finding. It's like replicating previous ones, but this is a bit like worrying in a sense that, that if parents are really active with the homework, that can actually have, have negative effects concerning math anxiety. And then they also found this uh, contextual effect that to my knowledge, maybe hasn't been studied at least, not in a, this big sample at least, that uh, they found that uh, the, the class level math anxiety uh, affected performance negatively. But this wasn't like evident in all countries. So here were some cultural differences. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, that made me think about the study that we did a couple of years ago uh, in, in Finland, where we actually looked also at, we looked at different emotions uh, during math lessons, but there was also math anxiety that we measured. And there we also find, found that this uh, contextual factors had an effect on, on math anxiety levels for students. Uh, and uh, in that study, we actually found that uh, we looked at students with special educational needs and without special educational needs in mathematics. And, and then we also looked at uh, different, like basically how was the, uh, instruction organized the teaching was it in inclusive settings or was it in small groups uh, and there we actually found that students with special educational needs uh, had lower math anxiety when they were in, in in small groups receiving math instructions compared to being in inclusive settings and then we also found that in, in these uh, general classrooms if there were a higher proportion of of students with special needs, then everyone had elevated math anxiety levels. And uh, we like thought that one explanation for this might be that like teachers don't have uh, as much time to help students if there are a lot of students who really need extra support. So, so we see that many of these like uh, possible explanations or indicators or predictors of math anxiety are like the teacher and the parents. And, and, and that is also something that has been like found previously. So this is a, like a bit of a, uh, I would say a background to this phenomenon. We see that it's quite complex, that there are many levels, many different factors playing in. And, and now in my talk, I will like try to focus more on this performance, our anxiety performance link and, and also the anxiety development, what do we know about that? And uh, well, math anxiety has been studied about 70 years or so, so quite a, quite a long time there has been like research on, on this topic. But still when you start to look at uh, development of math anxiety, so I was a bit uh, surprised that it's really hard to find longitudinal studies that actually would have like measured math anxiety at, at successive time points and reported like how the mean levels are changing over time. So many of the studies that even, even said that they were like developmental. So then when you started looking at them more in detail, they actually just had, had samples of students of different ages. So, so it was not the same students that were actually followed. It was more of a cross-sectional design, but with, with different age groups. And uh, probably there are definitely more than just these that I have now listed, but this is like, there isn't like a, a whole load of, of studies with on, on math anxiety development. So that is a, like a tip that, that the, I, I think it's really would be good if there would be more studies on, on math anxiety development. And uh, uh, if we look at these results, they are not that clear cut either, even though there is this general uh, consensus more or less that we, we think that math anxiety, uh, we now know that, and many studies in the last 10 years have shown that, that math anxiety already exists in the, in the primary grades, lower grades. And uh, then it, we think that it increases 
during the school years and, and probably peaking there in the in adolescence. But actually now when we when we look at these longitudinal studies, they are like showing uh, like that there are some studies that have found actually a decreasing trend. Some studies have shown a, a rather stable trend in math anxiety levels. And then there are some studies that have shown an increasing trend. And basically those that have been done with younger kids have actually found a, a decreasing trend. Uh, but then again, we, we have, I have to like comment that, for example, the Finnish study by Sorvo, uh, if I remember correct, they, they also just measured two time points. So it's always like from grade two to grade three with one sample, then another sample from three to four, another sample from four to five and, and so on. So it's not like the same kids from grade two to grade six, but still they found a decreasing trend. And then, then with, the older ones, they have found stable trends and some studies have found an increasing trend. But that it's also to know that some of these studies are really old already, over 30 years. And uh, for example, this Wang, Wang et al study that was published last year was actually on the, I think it's the same data that the Wigfield Me study, it's just a reanalysis of that. So, so basically there, there is some longitudinal studies, but they are, they, they are quite, quite old already. Uh, uh, the same thing if we now like, so, so we see that there is, is, is a need to, to look at math anxiety development. So there would be a good if we would have more studies on that. Uh, a similar pa pattern is found when we look at the, the relations between math anxiety and performance. Uh, there is also quite, uh, differing or, or results going on in different directions. So basically there is support for three different models uh, in, in the literature. So one, one model, this uh, debilitating anxiety model, uh, it assumes that, that prior math anxiety has a negative effect on subsequent math performance even when controlling for prior performance. Uh, and here, basically the, the line of thinking is that it's like uh, two ways this debilitating anxiety model works. One way is that it's uh, more uh, the anxiety or math anxiety interfer interferes with your cognitive processes. For example, when if you are feeling anxious and have to uh, solve a, a mathematical uh, task, uh, if you are feeling really anxious, uh, the anxiety will tax your working memory resources, which in turn makes it harder to complete the math tasks. So that's one way that, that it is thought that this debil debilitating anxiety model works. Uh, the other way is that if you have math anxiety, you, you start to avoid math so you train less try to avoid it in every situation which in the long run makes you perform weaker again in math so so two two pathways that that, that would be like described by this debilitating anxiety model uh, then the deficit model uh, it, me again assumes that it's basically math performance that drives uh, the development of math anxiety. So if you are performing poorly, you will develop math anxiety. And, and that's of course also logical. So if you are not doing well, then your, your self-confidence go, goes down and, and, and it's not so fun. And then, then you get anxious to, to be in situations that you feel that you are not, not competent in. And then of course, we also have studies that have shown uh, support for both of these models and, and they are usually called then that, that this relationship is reciprocal. But again, we see that there is like many options and, and, and the literature is by no means like uh, agreeing on, on, on how the relationship really looks like. So uh, now if we move to, to what we have been doing, around these questions. So the first study that I, I thought that I would tell you a bit about is one that we have 
uh, done in Norway. So we have a, a pro project there, uh, IC numbers, uh, the, the scripture is there on the left. And then oh, from that project now, we, we have we finished the data collection now during the COVID. And, and there were, of course, some, some problems with that. But we, we managed to get at least uh, three, three time points of, of data collected. But this uh, study here is about the two first data collection points. And, and here we, in this study, we looked at the developmental relations between math anxiety, uh, numerical magnitude processing, and arithmetic skills from first to second grade. So, so that was the thing that we were interested in. Uh, we had uh, about 260 Norwegian children, and we measured math anxiety with the Achievement Emotions Questionnaire Elementary School. Uh, and here we, we used seven items from the math anxiety scale. We didn't use the, the scale in the achievement emotions question and work that they are about, uh, also about test situations, but those items we didn't take, take into this uh, analysis because in, in the Norwegian system, students don't have tests in grade one or two yet. So, so we didn't use those items that were measuring test situations. And then we had a standardized arithmetic test, uh, a Norwegian one, of course. And then we used the uh, SUMP test to measure magnitude processing skills. It's developed in Belgium by Brenchard and Desmet and, and colleagues. And, uh, uh, we analyzed the data with a latent change score model. And here is, of course, now a lot of uh, numbers in, in, in this model, but I, I will just walk you through the, the most important results. And the thing that we, we saw, well, we were, of course, interested to see that how, how did math anxiety develop? And uh, we saw that, that we didn't find an increasing trend or a decreasing trend. So in our, our data, the, the math anxiety showed a stable development if we look at the total means for, for T1 and T2. Uh, to one, one important thing here is to, to note is that, that there was significant variation in the development. So that means that although the mean level in the whole sample was rather stable, individuals uh, developed differently in, in math anxiety. And then uh, the interesting finding was that we, we found that math anxiety development was uh, related to arithmetic skills development. So that if you uh, had a steeper arithmetic skills development, your math anxiety was was got developed in a, in a more favorable manner. So, so as expected, so that these two, both arithmetic skills and math anxiety, so their development was, was linked. While we did not find a similar thing for magnitude processing and math anxiety. And uh, also we didn't find any gender differences in math anxiety. And, and this is quite, uh, align with the literature, if we look at, at studies done with younger children, then, then we usually do not find gender differences in math anxiety. But after, after like when they get a bit older, then, then we, we start to find gender differences so that girls tend to report more math anxiety, but we didn't find it in this uh, grade one and, and, and when they were in grade one or in grade two. Uh, but, uh, here is also important to note that uh, in this study, we weren't really able to say anything about the, uh, if our results supported the debilitating anxiety model, the, the deficit model, or, or the reciprocal model. We, we saw that development in both performance and anxiety were related, but we can't really say which one is, is driving the other, or is it so that it's reciprocal. Uh, then we have a, another study going on with another group uh, with little, a little bit older students. 
And here we'll, we're also interested in development of math anxiety over time and then the relationship with, between performance and, and anxiety. And this one, this study is not yet published. It isn't even submitted. So it's quite work in, in progress still. Uh, but here we had uh, almost 600 students from Finland and these were a bit older. So you see grade seven to grade nine. So they were like, they started to be, uh, we started following them when they were 13 year old and then until they were, uh, well, up to 16 year old, some of them. And uh, we measured math anxiety. And here we have a, a scale that we have, have like constructed ourselves. And uh, well, it's inspired by, by scales that have been used previously, but they, it's like a brief, brief scale with five items measuring mm, worry and, uh, and emotional math anxiety. So it, it doesn't like, separate between the, these two dimensions it's like a, a combined scale in, in that sense and it's really short only five items uh, and then we had a standardized math performance test that we that is standardized in, in Finland and then we also asked about these students educational aspirations so we we asked about what's the highest academic degree they would like to have uh, or like to achieve and uh, the highest academic degree they, they think they will see. So uh, a realistic aspiration and a more idealistic. And then we also asked about uh, specifically if they would uh, uh, study uh, in a program that, that requires good math skills. So, so one that is more specific math and two more general educational aspiration questions. So. Let's see now how the data looks like. Uh, just if we look at the, the cross-sectional or, or correlations overall, not just cross-sectional, we can see that uh, here in yellow, this upper triangle, it's like how the math uh, measure is correlated over time. So we see quite high stable correlations for the math measure. And the same goes with the math anxiety scale, quite stable and, and high correlation from one time point to another. And yeah, I, I forgot to say the time points. We have like four time points, uh, grade seven, fall, grade seven, spring, grade nine, fall, grade nine, spring. So there is a bigger jump from grade seven, spring to grade nine, fall. And the red ones here are the correlations between math anxiety and performance. So they are there around minus 0.20, minus 0.25 around. So quite as previous studies have, have shown that the, the, like how these correlations tend to look like. Uh, then we, of course, we, we check that our measure is working in a similar way across time points. So that's one important thing when you do longitudinal research, you, you have to like check that, that the measure you are using is actually working in a similar way over the years and not so that, the, that it starts to measure something a bit differently because then the, the, the changes in, in, in the means are they, they can be just like measurement error or or some kind of method effect so so that that we checked and it was like okay the, the measure worked in a similar way across time points and uh, then we did a, a, a growth curve model or latent growth curve model for both the anxiety and performance so this is just the, again the the numbers we don't really need to look at them so so closely but more probably uh, we can say that the model fit was quite good for this, this model. And uh, if somebody is like wondering why there are like three factors here for the anxiety and only two factors for, for the performance. So here we have the uh, intercept for the math anxiety. So the starting level, and here we have the slope, the linear slope. So the growth, the linear growth, and here we have the, the quadratic growth 
of the anxiety because we saw that a, a quadratic growth model fitted the data better than just a linear growth. And then for math, the, it, it was enough to have just a linear growth model because it seems that the math skills are developing quite linearly. And uh, as you can see here on the right, we see that in this age group, we actually, we, we, we find that the, there is like a significant uh, increase, but it's like not totally linear, the development of math anxiety. So it starts to increase here. Uh, this is like grade seven fall, grade seven spring. And these three and four are, are what, about what it's estimated what happens on grade eight. But here we actually did not like measure this. So this is just model based means for grade eight for grade eight spring. So we see that there is an increasing trend, but then it's then it stops the increase here in the in grade nine. So then, then it flattens out while the math of course goes up. So the, the skills got get better all the time. And uh, uh, we wanted to like look at this a bit more closer, this, this math anxiety development, because now this is like a, a mean value. And we saw that there was in, in, uh, a significant variation in the, in the growth. So, so we actually asked ourselves that how is it that uh, can we identify like different developmental profiles of math anxiety and performance? So could we like find some kind of patterns that are more general so that we could find one group, for example, of students that would be more stable in math anxiety and then, then another one that would have a more increasing and maybe we would find some decreasing also. So, we, we did this uh, that we combined this latent growth curve model uh, with, uh, with a mixture model so that we try to find like model, like it's more or less model based clustering. So we, we, we see how many different classes uh, describe the data best based on model fit. And, and then when we find the optimal number of classes, we can look at how does, how does these classes look like. And now when it's a growth mixture model, uh, we look at classes based on the, both the intercept and the growth parameters. And uh, here uh, we have done uh, some analysis on this. And, and it seems like, uh, a two two profile solution describes the data best. So uh, here in this first table here on yellow, uh, here is actually that we are testing one class, two class, three class, four class, and then there are some values here. And just the, as a like quick note, uh, uh, when we generally want the big to decrease all the time until the optimal model comes by. Now we see that the big actually decreases also from two to three and from three to four. But the mo the biggest decrease is of course from one to two. Uh, then the entropy is like how the, this classification accuracy, classification quality. And, and here again, higher numbers are better. So actually these have better entropy than the two class, but the two class still has quite okay. And then here is a, like a, a significant can test. So this small two class model is significantly better than the one class, but then the three and four, they aren't getting any, any better. And then we also see the class sizes, how big are the different classes. So we see that if we add the third class here, third profile, then it would be a really small group of only 16 students. So it seems that this two class solution is the most plausible one. And uh, this is the math anxiety trajectories of those two profiles. So, so we see that we have this one who has quite stable and low math anxiety. So here is like this uh, score is, the raw score is like, can be between one and five. So this 1.5 a bit over is quite low, while this is a bit higher. And we see that this, Second group, this is the profile two. So that these are the, the descriptives for both groups. So we see that this profile two, it's the, the smaller one. So here is about 120 students and here about 460. 
So we see that this uh, smaller group has elevated math anxiety. It keeps going up a bit, but then, then goes a bit down in the end on, on grade nine. And uh, now when we had found these two different developmental profiles, we wanted, of course, to, to see how they are related to these educational aspirations. And uh, we did uh, that comparison in, in the same model. And uh, basically what we found was that uh, there weren't any differences between these profiles in, uh, in these realistic aspirations and idealistic aspirations. So these aspirations overall concerning highest educational level you would want to achieve. But there were significant differences between the groups uh, concerning math related educational aspirations. So we see that this group that had elevated math anxiety levels had lower math related educational aspirations. So in a way, quite nice result. It, it shows a bit that, okay, there, there, there seems to be well, this is kind of that it validates a bit that the, it seems to be uh, influencing some, something, something this that you have like elevated levels of math anxiety. So it's meaningfully related to, to aspirations. Uh, the thing that I didn't show you here uh, was that actually we also in this growth model, we found that the initial level of anxiety had a negative effect on your math development, which means that in, in this data with this adolescent students, we, we found more support for the debilitating anxiety model, if we think these three models on how, how anxiety and performance are related. So, so but, uh, but the effect was not like super strong, but it was still just significant. Uh, yeah, uh, and uh, from that, uh, I thought that I would like to still have, have time to show you two other studies. One, this one is like got published in January, so quite recently. And then, then we also have another uh, meta-analysis uh, uh, in, in progress that is on math anxiety interventions. But in line with this debilitating anxiety model, uh, and especially this, that anxiety is reducing your cognitive resources by taxing working memory resources when you are trying to solve math problems. So we were interested in to look at how much evidence do we really have for, for this effect. So, so we decided to do a meta-analysis on the relationship between math anxiety and working memory and also to, to look at the indirect effect of math anxiety through working memory on math performance. So in this meta-analysis, we actually had two research questions. We looked at this, uh, the research question A was the relationship between math anxiety and working memory. And the research question two was the indirect effect. So path A times path B effect through working memory. And, uh, we found uh, 1,900 about studies in, in the first screening. And then after all these different steps in, in the systematic literature search, uh, there were, uh, now I have to move you a bit so that I can see something. Uh, there were is 57 studies left that answered research question one and eight, only eight studies that that could be included in, in research question two. So that the low number of studies may makes those results quite, quite like, well, I would say descriptive in that sense. And, and probably there will be need for more, more studies there that have looked at the indirect effect more, more specifically or have done studies with, with this design. Uh, so the results in short, if we just see the overall effects. So basically our meta-analysis confirmed this uh, uh, theory that math anxiety could like tack is related to working memory. And, and you could like think about this uh, debilitating anxiety model that, 
that one one way that math anxiety is negatively influencing math performance is by taxing working memory resources. So we both find an, a significant overall effect size of minus 0.17 from math anxiety to working memory. And, uh, and then the overall indirect effect size was minus 0.09. So not that strong, but, but still it was there and it was significant. But, but also if we think that the usual correlations between math anxiety and math performance are there about minus 25, uh, then, then we see that a, a part of that effect goes through the, could go through the working memory if we, we think about it. And the other one is maybe this more avoidance behavior that, that, that would like be, be another path from math anxiety to, to math performance. Uh, but now I, I want to go to this uh, study that we have like in progress and uh, we have come quite far also with this meta-analysis so that we, we, we hopefully can, can send it, submit it in the coming weeks. So uh, here we are more or less the same people. I, I forgot to, to say, say, say something about my co-authors. So we are basically a, a uh, this is another research group, but we have a, we have a pro, we have got project funding for investigating math anxiety, but due to COVID, we have not been able to start the data collection yet. So that, that, that was, well, in a way that was like a positive thing because then we like decided that, okay, we, now we have time to do, do a couple of meta analysis on, on the topic to, to, and, and it's, of course, a good basis then for the empirical studies. So this other meta-analysis uh, is on the interventions that have tried to reduce math anxiety. So we basically wanted to map what interventions have been done, have they been effective, and uh, is it so that these interventions, do they also have a positive effect on math performance? Or is it only effective regarding reducing math anxiety? So uh, we tried again to, to search the literature and, and we found a couple of uh, systematic reviews or, or more like, or, or some kind of theor more theoretical or viewpoint papers on math anxiety, where they like uh, highlight some promising interventions. But to our knowledge, there hasn't really been a, a systematic literature search and a meta-analysis on the effect of these math anxiety interventions. So, so that, that, that drove us to, to do this, this study. And uh, again, the, the systematic search you can see here, it was about first uh, search yielded almost 2,500 studies. But then after these different steps, uh, the, we landed in 50 studies that could answer research question one and two. And uh, then the, of these 50, 30 were suitable to also answer research question three. So this research question three is the intervention effect on math performance, because not all these studies on these math anxiety interventions did have math performance as an outcome, but 30 of them had. And what did we find? Well, uh, to, to your right, you can see the, the forest plot, but of course that's a bit small here, but here, it's just an example of the 77, uh, oh, 75 effect sizes that were like found in these 50 studies on the effect on math anxiety. And uh, the, the things that we found, well, the first reason question, again, I, I forgot to, to say anything about that, but we were also interested in to look at the quality of these interventions. So we use this um, uh, 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 
a like fixed protocol to, to score all intervention studies and, and, and grade them one, two, three, so that, 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 that they were like really good quality, medium and low. And uh, then we related this grading of the methodological quality to the intervention effects. And, and we found that study quality was not related to intervention outcomes. And, and there have been some similar findings concerning math, math interventions in general, that study quality has not always been related to intervention outcomes. And, and in a way, one could interpret it that it's quite nice that also these studies with lower quality, sometimes you are a bit afraid that if you have a lower quality study, then they might overestimate the effect of the intervention, but it didn't seem to be the case with these math anxiety interventions. But overall, the study quality was in the more uh, towards the lower end. So what one, one implication could be that, that we, we need to step up the, the methodological quality of intervention studies on, on math anxiety. Uh, then the Research question two, that how does, did this overall these uh, 50 studies, how, how did they reduce math anxiety or could they reduce? And the answer to that was yes. Uh, overall, we found a mean effect size of minus 0.46. So this negative effect means that these interventions were, were successful in, in reducing math anxiety. And, and here you see the, the confidence interval. In, in brackets here. So quite nice and, and quite a moderate, moderate effect size. Uh, maybe a bit higher than, than I would have dared to hope even. So, so quite, quite nice results. Uh, then we did, uh, uh, of course, to, we tried to categorize what kind of interventions. So we tried to group them in some kind of more bigger uh, groups of intervention types. And we have now like tried different grouping categories, but this was the, the one that at the moment seems most reasonable. So we, we categorized the interventions into interventions that try to somehow support the motivation of students and that, that way reduce math anxiety. Then there were studies that tried to uh, uh, influence the emotions of the students during uh, doing math. So this different kind of emotion regulation stuff. And then lastly, the third category we, we have named now cognition. So there are like a various things that the interventions really weren't, they weren't decide like directly influence how you feel or, or how motivated you are, but more give you tools to perform better in math. So, so these different kinds of approaches we, we named like cognitive interventions. And here are the results. And most, a majority of the effect sizes were, were like classified as emotion interventions. Uh, the effect sizes, there weren't like significant differences between these three groups. But the cognition group had, ha, has like slightly bigger, but of course, when it's not significant, it can be due to chance. Uh, but then when we see about uh, how did this intervention, did they have a positive effect on math performance? And the answer is yes, they improved students' math performance. So doing these interventions overall, they had a, a even more positive effect on math performance. So it, it, that was a slightly bigger than, than this uh, reduction in math anxiety. And here we actually had a significant difference between the interventions so that the cognitive interventions were the, the most uh, effective ones in, in, this, in this instance. Uh, then there were also some other moderator analysis here that we, we found that age played a part so that with younger kids, uh, the, the effects were better on performance. On older kids, the effects were better on reducing anxiety. Uh, yeah, I can't remember now if there was something else that was 
interest. Yeah, and longer interventions were more effective than shorter ones. So, so that was basically the, the main moderator results. So, but this is, again, this might change a bit when we get some feedback on our manuscript, but I think we will like go with this motivation, emotion, cognition. It, it, it seems uh, working quite well because it's, well, it's rather challenging to try to like make some groups of these various interventions that have, that have been done. Uh, and uh, lastly, I want to like a bit continue about this project. So, so this project about, that contains these two meta-analyses uh, is actually named the same thing as, as my talk today. So choking under pressure, linking math anxiety with math performance. And it, we have had to postpone the project start because of COVID. So the original idea was that we would start, had started the data collection last spring, but now we have like decided that we have like postponed it uh, to this spring first, but now again, when the COVID situation in, in Sweden was a, was a bit uh, bad, then we decide, okay, we will start in the fall instead. So then we will have a longitudinal design from grades three to five, because we are really interested to see how math anxiety develops in this age group as it should increase, but all these the longitudinal studies with younger kids are basically not supporting that idea again. Of course, cross-sectional studies give some support to that. So we are really interested to, to look at that closer. And then we have this different more, we have an experimental part that I haven't really talked about, but uh, there is indications that working memory, it mediates the effect of anxiety on performance, but it also seems that it mo actually moderates the effect also. So that is something that we want to tease out in an experimental design, but I, I see my, that my time is ticking, so I don't have time to talk about that. And then we are also like planning to do an own intervention to see that can we reduce math anxiety. <clears throat> so, so those are the things that we are doing in, 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 in the near future within this project. Okay, but now I think I, I will stop here because now I only have like 12 or 10 minutes left. Thank you. Thanks, Johan. That was, <clears throat> that was really interesting. Um, we've already got some questions coming in the chat, so I might just um, read them out so everybody can hear them, even though yep. you can read them. Um, so so uh, Kathy has asked, can you say more about the role of parental engagement in increasing maths anxiety? Um, and also a follow up of can teachers use any sort of maths anxiety scale to assess how pupils are feeling? Mm -hmm. Well, good questions. Uh, there is a couple of uh, uh, studies done in, 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 I think in the US where they measured quite uh, like uh, thoroughly parents' math anxiety. And, and then the, in, in that study, at least, it was more this, uh, this effect was evident uh, that it went through doing homework with your kid, with your child. But it was more that it was parents who themselves were feeling quite higher math anxiety that, that actually the negative effect there was found in those studies. Now, now in this newer one that I showed you that was on the team's data, it, it seemed that it didn't differentiate between, between different parent levels of math anxiety, but, but probably when it still was found in this large sample, it was quite robust, but I can't really. Uh, this is like something that I usually talk a lot with when I'm like talking about math anxiety with teacher and teacher students. Okay, I don't really know what, what, my, what my advice would be because I think it's really nice that parents engage in their kids homework. But then again, when you see this kind of results, it's like hard to say what, what you really would recommend. So I, I can't really answer what would be, be good, good to do there. And then concerning math anxiety measures, there are a lot of those. Uh, 
most are probably nowadays still in use by only researchers, but there are quite short ones that have been used quite a lot already. Uh, that would probably be quite easy to, to use as a teacher also, if you would want to identify those who are at risk of having mad anxiety. So we, for example, uh, we, have a, we have a big project in Finland where we are, we are trying now to, to develop digital based uh, assessment tools in math. And there we have like this uh, one who is, starts to be quite ready. It's called a dyscalculia screener. So it's a screener to identify children with math difficulties. But there in the same digital platform, we have actually now developed uh, a math anxiety measure, but it's not, we have used like existing measures and, and piloted those. And, and actually we today discussed that it seems quite nice. So we will probably in the coming years start to use in Finland or, or to, to uh, how, how we say this in English, but we will like, well, teachers will have a digital tool to assess math anxiety if they, if they want to. So it will be just freely available to all teachers. Um, thanks, Johan. So Gary is, is asking, and I'm assuming he's asking about comorbidity in the studies from the systematic reviews, but whether any in any of the studies children were screened for pre-existing uh, general, generalized anxiety disorder. Mm. Uh, yeah, uh, in the meta-analysis, we, we did not look specifically on, on the covariates of general anxiety. There were, like, of course, in some of the studies, there has been, like, uh, that you have been controlling for general anxiety. Uh, we did not take that into account in the in the meta-analysis uh, calculations, but uh, I know from the studies that I have at least like read that even though you control for general anxiety, these effects will still be there and, and be significant. Of course, they are reduced slightly, but but still, it's quite differentiated still from the general anxiety, the math anxiety construct, or it seems to be so. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm just looking at a question here from Hester, who's interested in um, the societal expectations on maths anxiety and whether you can elaborate on that. She's put, sorry if I missed it, just in case it was covered earlier on. Mm -hmm. uh, well, if I, if I understand the question correctly, that like what kind of, uh, uh, consequences math anxiety has so so I think it's I think it's more about um, the the consequences that societal expectations have on subsequent math anxiety so you know in some cultures it's very important that you're good at maths yeah 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 probably because you yeah now, now I understand because we, that usually we see that this kind of math anxiety and test anxiety levels are higher, for example, in Asian countries compared to, for example, Nordic countries, because in Nordic countries, we usually don't have, for example, high stake testing in the same way as, as they have. So I have just myself done some studies a few years ago on test anxiety, where we measured Finnish, Swedish and Chinese uh, grade three students test anxiety and there we actually found this that the mean levels were much higher in, in in China compared to the Nordic countries and the gender differences were were uh, reversed so that the boys in China had much higher test anxiety than girls had and in the Nordic countries we had this more in the western world the, the typical that girls have a bit higher than boys and we we like we had a, a Chinese researcher with us, of course, in, the, in that paper, and, and, and we discussed a lot. And, and there we like discussed or think that one explanation would be the culture that there uh, it's the it's much higher pressure on boys that they would have to like. Uh, that it's the family honor that the boy will like do well in school and, 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 and be successful so that the boys had much higher pressure on on them in school compared to girls. So yeah, definitely there is like social impacts on, on anxiety. Thank you. And there's a question from Elizabeth that says, is there a developmental factor in maths anxiety? I'm not sure specifically. Um... Well, well, yeah, I think it's like, a, there are like several developmental factors in, in that sense. 
of course, much is about that. I think that we get more and more like aware of our skills and we, be, we get more realistic in evaluating how good are we at something, how bad are, are we at something, how good are I compared to my classmates and, and so on. So, so I think that, that when our like cognitive processes are starting to make these ever constant evaluations, that's one, well, we know we human beings are a bit like that, that we constantly are looking what the other, other people are doing and thinking and we are, we are like thinking a lot about other people. And I, I think that this, this social comparisons and then of course that we are like doing this internal comparisons with our like, how are we like doing math? That is like something that drives the development. And then of course, what happens there in school, in class and with parents will like drive this development, I think. Okay, thank you. I think we've probably got time for one more. And this, I quite like this one from Taz saying, on a day to day basis, how do you relate lower maths performance to maths anxiety and not cognitive factors like working memory uh, without constantly asking the students about their motivation? And I'm assuming their, you know, their, their levels of stress, etc. Sorry, my dogs are barking. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, 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 well. Actually, this is also something that we have been thinking about how to how to measure like I don't have a good answer, but but we have like actually applied funding for doing doing study where we would like collect this kind of intensive data. So basically this time ser series data that we would get students to do math on computers as a assessments, like, uh, not assessment, but doing math tasks during ordinary math lessons and embed in those tasks some short questions about like how did you feel now and, and so on so this would be so because we would really like to see what in the long run if you like model these like intensive happenings what is happening on the task level during a, uh, during one class and then have classes over a, a certain weeks and model those to tease out this kind of what is happening. So it's not just working memory. It's like, okay, how, how do you like, yeah, what, what is shaping math anxiety actually in, in the task situation? But that, that is really like something that hasn't been really done. But nowadays the, the statistical modeling is going so much forward that you can actually do that. And there is on other fields in, in personality, for example, psychology, there has been these kind of designs already. Thank you um, for that. Um, unfortunately, I don't think we've got time for more questions because we've just got one minute, um, which leads me to say thank you. I actually had three questions, but I don't have time for them. I might email you. Um, yeah. But uh, thank you so much for that talk, it was really, really interesting. And from looking at the chat, I can see that uh, everybody else thought so as well. So um, the for anybody who wants to look back on this, the recording will be shared shortly. But um, other than that, just just thank you very much, Johan. It was a really interesting talk. Yeah, and, and you can, there was something in the chat that if it's possible to contact me. Uh, so my I put my email here in chat if, if I didn't think I had that never there in the in the PowerPoint stuff. So anyway, oh, there it is. is. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Yeah, so this is the short. Then this the same goes with Johan dot Korhonen at Abu.fi, but this shorter one is usually more easier to use. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. It was thank fun. You. Thank you so much. Okay, I hope to see you again soon. Yep. See you Bye. all. Bye-bye. Bye bye.